think All it right. sounded good in the winter. It sounded good in the winter, <laughs> but here we are. This is the 7 p.m. start for the Wednesday, March 12, 2014 Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Uh, first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from February 26. Move approval. Okay, I think I saw one item that I was going to see if I could, oh, now, it was in number six, as I recall, and it was the word one, two, three, four, five, six line down, begins within study, R and outside area. I think it's area, A R E. Within study area, area. yeah. yeah. That was the only problem I saw. So we have a motion. Is there a second with that correction? I trust. Jim or Wendy? I'll take. I'll take Wendy this we'll time. Co <laughs> we'll co-second that. <laughs> all right. Um, all in favor of the approval of the minutes of the twenty-six? Say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions. Okay. Bill, correspondence. Uh, I think the only thing I was going to report on uh, is that the council heard an appeal of a denial of the Board of Adjustment of a condition use permit for a um, guest home, guest yeah, house. And there was discussion about whether compensation could be taken in exchange for a guest house. There are uses that are described within the zoning code related to for compensation lodging activities that are traditionally bed and breakfast, boarding houses, hotels, motels. And, and a guest house is kind of an extension of the living quarters, sleeping quarters intend to be used primarily as sleeping quarters only for guests and as the code reads and or servants. And so the, the council considered that matter um, here recently and asked that the commission consider the guest house definition and either adding clarity whether compensation could or could not be provided in association with that kind of use. So we'll have that coming forward as we maybe as we talk about the ADUs and, and the implications of that on other uses that may be kind of similar in nature. Uh, it may be that the ADU kind of takes care of that depending upon what the ultimate outcome is. Um, but they are different in that it's a they're different but similar in that a guest house is something that's termed accessory living quarters, and that's defined as being a detached structure accessory to a single family dwelling, you know, with no more than two bedrooms that's used as sleeping quarters, you know, without a kitchen, it's used as sleeping quarters for guests and or servants only. And so that was kind of the, the concept was, well, could that be rented out for compensation and that kind of activity? And so um, the, the board had denied it based on compensation and also an opinion that uh, it implied because it was the extension of the uh, living quarters of the single family home that, they, that the residents or occupants of that guest house would have to be living as a single housekeeping unit with the home. Um, so that just it's probably an area of clarification that needs to occur in, in the code. It was the first one we'd had in 14 years. Um, so we hadn't had many of those. We've had about five, I think, since in the last 25 years. and. Um, historically, I think it's been that compensation hasn't been taken, and the, the records of three that I could find, they had conditions that prohibited rental of them. Um, and so, you know, we just need to provide some greater clarity for the public and the community as a whole. So, I just think we'll be folding that into the conversation as it relates to uh, accessory going in us when we get into looking at the code language. Okay. Um, Another, I guess, correspondence item. Tonight's glasses are recyclable plastic rather than the reusables because <laughs> of the dishwasher related issue in the back room. So <laughs> just in case you're wondering why we're not using our reusable glasses, there's your answer. Anything else under correspondence? Joel, transportation? Transportation Commission will meet at 4 o'clock tomorrow uh, here. Um, Topics on the agenda, uh, Tom Lamar is going to talk about uh, his uh, attendance at the National Bike Summit. Uh, um, we'll lead into uh, some further discussion of bikes on sidewalks. Um, 
And there's an item on here, uh, Harvest Hills Subdivision Report. Uh, do you know what that is? I, sus I, I don't. I, I believe it's just a report back to the commission, since I don't think the commission has met since the council's approval of that subdivision. Okay. Probably reporting back on the conditions of approval as it related to on-street parking. Uh, I know that was a discussion that the commission had had as well right. with regard to concerns about not having any available avail on-street parking. So I suspect it's just a report back. Okay. A question for you. You may or may not know about it, um, Joel, but the, this morning when I was walking to work, there were students on every corner taking survey information about bike use downtown. Is that part of it? Any kind of it's nothing transportation? That I know anything about. Oh, okay. They were trying to figure out how well bike lanes work and other people use them in, in, in relation to the sidewalk issue. Yeah. So sounds, like, going on six, sounds like a class project. Yeah, I mean, there were <laughs> two or three of them on every asking, you know, sort of marking yeah. who was doing what. So I was just curious yeah. if you knew anything about it. So well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask tomorrow and okay. see if anybody knows. <laughs> Great. Anything else? Okay. We've reached the open microphone portion of the agenda where members of the public may speak to the commission regarding matters that are not on tonight's agenda or currently pending before Planning and Zoning Commission. Please come up to the microphone here, state your name and address for the record. Limit your remarks to three minutes. Do we have any takers? Okay. And of course, the reminder is to our audience at home, this is your big chance to be on TV. So <laughs> consider coming on down. Number six, Bill, approval of commission recommendations regarding the North Main Street zoning amendments. Um, this is an item that we discussed at the last meeting um, regarding that area of, of Main Street as it relates to the council's goal of trying to expand the perceived area downtown um, north to the E Street intersection on Main. And so we kind of did a review. We looked at the various zoning designations, you know, existing uses and for the exi existing uses in, in the corridor, the placement of structures relative to property lines. Um, and then we looked at uh, several different zoning districts and their relationship to um, looking at what might help further the council's goal or what uh, amendments or changes would be appropriate. Uh, the council, or the commission, I should say, ultimately concluded that the MB district probably fits the existing uses um, most closely, uh, and some of those are fairly recent and significant investments in the corridor. But there were two primary recommendations related to looking at a CUP that might allow for the reduction of a front yard setback to be able to have the buildings closer to the street, and also a possible expansion of residential uses above and behind commercial in the corridor. And you may recall we had a, a, a gentleman who was here looking at purchasing a building in that area, looking at trying to establish residential above and behind commercial uses. Uh, so I tried to kind of capture that in a memo and wanted to give a chance for the commission to review the, the main recommendations on the bullet points and the numbered items at the end. Um, you know, the first of which really talked about that the existing one-way couplet system, roadway configurations, and vehicular volumes make the area distinctly different than downtown and present challenges to this, this achieving a similar character in the area. And I think that's something that the commission discussed a fair amount. Um, the second was that the motor business district was probably the most consistent uh, with the existing land uses and significant recent investments. Um, and that it may not be in the public interest to create um, non-conforming status of some of those uses. Uh, the th third was that the commission recognized the placement structures close to the sidewalk, um, creating the building and street wall, was a significant contributor in expanding that urban field downtown and recommending looking at a possible amendment to reduce that setback through a conditional use permit where it's consistent with the surrounding area um, and the comp plan. The fourth was that we've observed an increased desire from property owners to increase residential development within commercial corridors, um, giving an example of the Anytime Fitness Project, um, and feel that increased residential development above and behind commercial uses, um, which is a significant land use in downtown co core, would also contribute to achieving the council's goal. And would like to recommend that the city explore expansion of residential uses uh, in the NB district and other commercial zoning districts to promote greater mixed use developments in those areas. And then the final one was that the commission believes the installation of street trees and pedestrian scale lighting, sidewalk treatments and furnishings within study area would likely be the most significant step the city could take to realize the council's goal and recommend they pursue these efforts as soon as possible. Um, wanted to make sure that that accurately 
captured the opinion of the commission, and if that's the case, then we'll have the, the chair um, sign our initial and, and move on to the council. Mm -hmm. Joel? I would say you did a very good job of capturing our discussion. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I, Thank I you. approve of your points. And, and I think that within it, I don't know that we need to amend the document, but items three and four are the ones where council, where we most likely think council would like to direct us mm -hmm. to take further consideration. Uh, council may have some other things in mind as well, mm -hmm. but three and four we're <laughs> highlighting for them as places where they might suggest we do more work. And it's also just we include the maps and kind of the inventory of the land use as existing zoning as an attachment to the, to okay. the memo so that information is available to the council. Okay. So, other discussion? Could I have a motion to forward this to council? I will so move. Joel, all right, and a second? Second. Thank you, Gregory. All in favor of forwarding the memo to council, say aye. 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 Opposed? abstentions all right so we'll go forward you let me know what you need me to do and sounds good and your number seven as well bill review of the second adu public input session and proposed standards fairly brief item but i did want to touch base um, from the last meeting we kind of went through a discussion of what proposal would the commission like to present so we had the first um, public open house meeting in late January, really not presenting any potential proposal about how they could be allowed in the city of Moscow or what the standards would be. It was more of an educational outreach effort, discussing and you know, introducing what accessory dwelling units are, showing how other communities um, have addressed them or permitted them, explored and um, tried to illustrate some of the benefits that could be realized from them. And then really we're soliciting input without having actual proposal before them about whether they felt they should be allowed, how they should be allowed. And we asked some questions about relative importance about certain controls or standards that may go along with ADU's size and occupancy and parking and owner and uh, so forth. So we kind of went through that at the last meeting. And you know, I had envisioned we were going to be moving towards a proposal that would then go to a second open house, but the discussion was a little bit more broad about maybe we should provide an option, maybe a more restrictive or a more permissive option on each of those elements. So how should they be permitted, you know, only in certain districts or in all residential districts? Should off street parking require, yes, you know, one stall for the ADU or no? Um, and, and so the commission seemed to want to provide those as kind of maybe the more restrictive and the more permissive option and then solicit, you know, now we're getting into specifics. So there will be a, a you know, probably a size limit, you know, notation or there's some other really specific questions being posed. Um, but to try to then further refine from the information and input received during the first open house, you know, through a second. We're looking at probably that first week of April. Uh, because of spring break next week, trying to advertise or get information out for the following week would be kind of tough. A lot of people do tend to leave town. And so we thought pushing it just back one week to the first week of April for that uh, meeting would probably be the best thing to do. Probably do it in a very similar fashion that we did last time, probably in a five to seven time frame, something like that. Um, we would probably have the stations, some of the same poster boards we created for the first one because it has all the background information and the research information. We just start to add on at the end and start talking about a proposal to consider. And these are the, these are the items that the, the commission is considering. We'd like to have your input on what you would prefer and kind of give them two focused maybe options under each of those with respect to where they should be permitted and, and the individual standards and try to help refine um, what the commission would like to propose. So. So I want to make sure that's, I'm kind of visualizing how we could do that. Um, and I thought that was a direction that the commission wanted to go for the next um, open house session and wanted to make sure that that was, I uh, understood that correctly and that everybody was in general agreement with that approach. Are there any um, strategies to avoid the sort of specialized response that we had to the, you know what I mean, getting a bigger sample area or sample of people who aren't you know, opinionated really strongly one way or another because they're coming to that, that event. Is there a way we can 
I mean, the, the, the real the way to, to avoid that is to actually do a random sample survey. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that is something, you know, it, it is a more involved effort and yeah, sure expense and, and yeah. expense associated with it. It's not saying that that's not something we can do, but that's something that the, the commission is concerned about um, that we'd like to take. I mean, we, the two questions we had in the citizen survey, those are good. Uh, you know, I think statistically those are good. That's a random sample. It's right. not self-selected. Hopefully there's not significant bias within that result. And so you know, I think we can feel comfortable with those two questions. Obviously everything else is just information. It, it is information from the from the from those that chose to attend or participate in that process. And so the only way to really control for that is to have your sample, your participants be randomly selected. So mm -hmm. that otherwise it's you can do as much advertising and outreach, and it tends to be whoever has an interest in that topic is going to hone in on it and will participate in that effort. And so um, that, that's really the only way that I see that you can really get a, a, good, a good sample to avoid that potential bias. And that would involve mainly out. Okay. Right, that would put a multi-week delay in the process, I presume. Yeah, I mean, a mail survey is going to take us about probably six weeks to eight weeks to complete. Um, it will, depending upon the sample size, we, you know, you would, you typically would do a mailed survey, so you're not doing any type of bias about somebody who doesn't have the computer or access to electronic means. Um, that would include mailing out the piece, the survey, and a, a postage page return envelope. Typically, you need to allow four weeks for those to get back. You can get the most, you know, most of them that you're going to get back, you're probably going to get back in the first 10 days, 10 to 14 days. And beyond that, you get some trickle in. But I'd say, you know, in the, in the past years when I was in administration and, and doing the citizen survey, um, we would get the majority of responses in that first 14 days. And then beyond that, they'd kind of trickle in. And after about four or five weeks, you're pretty much done. I was thinking of a table at the farmer's market, but I guess actually that's sort of a self-selected it, it is, it, you know, to some degree. So, because um, it opens soon. Right? First of May. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, first of May. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, uh, but that is an option. If, if the commission, at the end of the day, well, after doing a second open house, is still concerned about, you know, whether that is representative. I mean, it's it's pretty extensive outreach that we don't, you know, haven't really done for other, you know, fairly significant code amendments. But it is something that's an option that if we want to try to pursue, we can take a look at it and see what we would estimate, depending upon the number of pieces we would mail out, um, what that cost would be, and whether it's something the Commission would like to pursue. Okay. I don't know if this is a dumb idea or not, but I just wondered if the City had ever considered anything like a, a survey monkey thing, that people could uh, go online to the City mm -hmm. website and, uh, you know, with some publicity about the open house, but then also add, if you can't make it to this, you could do this. Yeah, yeah we did that after the last open house. We oh, ran okay. it online for about three weeks on Survey mm -hmm. Monkey, three, four weeks. And we had probably, we had 28 responses on the on the document. And mm -hmm. I think we had maybe half of them were actual physical and half were online oh. responses. So um, we, we did do that last time. I, okay. we, I anticipate we would do that this time yeah. as well. Okay. Because it's just a way for those who can't make the meeting. We've got a mm -hmm. project page. We put the link on there. Advertise it. You know, come to the meeting. Or if you can't make it, you can you can certainly complete the survey online. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that provides that opportunity. And then we'll also post all the poster stations that we would have at the open house meeting on the web page, so somebody could look at those on their computer okay. and read through it, and then could respond if they weren't able to make that meeting. Uh, so we'll, we would just be doing the same thing. Okay. Bill, what would be the date in April? I think we're looking at the first or second. I think the first is a Tuesday, second is Wednesday. So I think we were honing in on the second was the most recent date. We were confirming room availability. Okay. Um, but that would be the first Wednesday of April. Um, and as soon as you've settled on a date, perhaps alert both the paper and the chamber mm -hmm. um, yep. in terms of trying to get into their communication yep. channels and then push out more as we get closer to actually try to get. Okay, so April 2, 5 to 7 is what we think we're doing here. For, and that, that is not one of our meeting nights. So it, will, it is not. It'll just be an event here and then afterwards go home. So if you can come, that would be great. Uh, Any, either one of those guys is open to, you know, to decide now. 
I think I think I'd prefer Wednesday the second so rather than April Fool's Day yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right, number eight is my item. Let's see if we can make the computing and all work here. Mm -hmm. A cough drop because I've been fighting a cold. I think I'm out of the out of the woods on this. Anyway, this is uh, I'm going to give you some introduction here to this. Uh, topic, but what I'm going to ask you to think about is sort of how we want to be thinking about our commitment to pro provide water and the relationship to the uh, what are called the PBAC water use limitations or the um, city's uh, groundwater management plan. On December 2nd, I went to city council and used the open microphone to ask a question. Oh, and this PowerPoint is one that was made by Steve Roshan, uh, who is the executive for the PBAC. And thank you to him because he did a really nice job. Um, and it's nice to capture the videos for you. Response period. Uh, actually, nobody came forward at our last city council meeting, so I don't have any responses prepared for anything. But anybody who's here tonight who has something on their minds they'd like to share with the council and me, as long as it's not on tonight's agenda, it's not pending before the Planning and Zoning Commission or the Board of Adjustment, and Mills is listening, or, or pertaining to a legal or personnel matter, it sounds like he's got it covered, uh, please state your name and address for our record. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mills Peterson, 841 Travoy. I'm here as a private citizen, though I'm also a member of the Tree Commission and the Planning and Zoning Commission. I was interested to hear about the council workshop this afternoon regarding alternative supplies of water. I'm concerned about the city's ability to continue to grow while also meeting its PBAC water commitments. Bill Beldap does a good job of informing P&Z about the water implications of individual zoning actions as they are taken. But this does not provide us a cumulative overview of the situation. My question is this, what is the city's current total annual liability to deliver water to the unbuilt but already annexed and zoned lots in Moscow? I realize that the question has many complexities and so the assumptions and caveats used to develop the answer should be included with it and may be as interesting as any numerical value. Thank you. If you'll linger there just a minute, I want to ask Les, because we always try to respond to these at our subsequent city council meeting. I want to make sure he has enough information so that we can try to come up with an estimate of what you're asking. Les? Well, it's an interesting question uh, in that the city, as I see it, does not actually have a liability to undeveloped property as it pertains to water. Mm. Now, I think the perspective here is that, and, and I'm actually going to try to answer this for you right here, uh, is that um, a city is a water provider, we have a service area, and we have a commitment to provide water service within that service area. Some of that service area is currently undeveloped. And so I believe that's the, the angle here in, in the question is, what is that commitment? And we do have some of that information uh, in our water comprehensive plan in terms of projected uh, water consumption out through 2060, a 50 year horizon. I can tell you at this point that the water rights the city has for its existing wells are sufficient to meet the demand projected through 2060. So from that perspective, we have the water rights and the capability to provide the water necessary to meet the projected growth within uh, current city limits and the projected city limits out through 50 years. That was part of the study in our comprehensive water system plan. <coughs> now, with regard to the PBAC limitations, that is a volume. Since that's been mentioned twice, I'll say Palouse Basin Aquifer, Aquifer Committee. Committee. Thank you, Nick. Um, <laughs> with, of which the city of Moscow is a member. Uh, 
those are we do have a voluntary limit that was set through the 1992 comprehensive water plan uh, for the basin and um, that is not the same as what we have in terms of capacity and water rights and so if the uh, city and I think this is where your question is going if the city indeed holds to the voluntary limitation within the groundwater management plan is there sufficient capacity left to serve the remaining undeveloped properties and or, or one might view or it as something how like much do those of us who are here need to conserve in order to make room for those of us who are not here yet and and still remain within that voluntary and remain within the voluntary, voluntary number cap. right and that is something i would have to do some research on so we'll I, and I'd that. feel better about a follow-up. Okay. So that was the framing of the question. And then two weeks later, let's see if this works. This meeting, we have okay. uh, some comments from Nils Peterson, who was asking about uh, the uh, water management and, and um, kind of a water budget. Uh, what is our liability for water production relative to properties that are not yet fully developed? And our Public Works Director, Les McDonald, has prepared a response for this evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, yes, as you noted, uh, Mr. Peterson was here in our last session and, and had some questions pertaining to what commitments the City of Moscow has with respect to water and the types of developments uh, that have been approved within the city limits but not yet constructed or inhabited. Uh, those take many forms, obviously including single-family residences and uh, residential subdivisions, uh, multifamily uh, type facilities, uh, duplex facilities, and commercial facilities. So in looking at that question, uh, enlisted the assistance of our Community Development Director, Bill Belknap, who keeps track of a lot of these things and I appreciate his, his assistance on that. The, um, some of the assumptions come, that come into play here are fairly critical when you look at this type of an issue. What is the commitment that we have to provide service? Uh, what type of uh, usage would one anticipate for the different types of construction and use of the property? So some of the assumptions uh, that have been generated, again, uh, these, these derive from Bill's work, um, looking at single-family homes, we're estimating an average household size of 2.25 people per home. Okay. Some folks might look for a higher number, some would look for lower, but that seems to be the typical within Moscow's climate. The uh, next item is the consumption that one would anticipate for an individual. So we use a number of 114 gallons per person per day, so that's per capita day. Uh, again, that's a number that varies tremendously by household, by city, by region, um, looking at our production numbers and our consumption numbers within the community, that number seems to be reasonably accurate, a uh, good re reflective number of our situation. <coughs> Excuse me. And the third parameter really has to do with uh, multifamily development and what density uh, typically we would see on average for multifamily development. Uh, in this case, we've used a number of 20 dwelling units per acre. Uh, that's important because then you look in multifamily at the amount of water used per acre, assuming those 20 dwelling units on average within an acre. So with that in mind, uh, there is a list of uh, about a dozen single-family residential subdivisions within the city that have undeveloped lots still out there waiting uh, for action. Uh, in total, they accumulate to about 340 lots currently platted within the city but not yet developed or inhabited. In the uh, two-family duplex uh, arena, uh, there are three plats that include those, uh, roughly 41 lots, of uh, duplex type construction, uh, not yet developed. And in the multifamily, again, looking at acreage, uh, there's really five plats that have multifamily properties within them that are currently undeveloped, uh, working to a total of just over 23 acres of multifamily. So when you take all of those numbers of number of lots and acreage of multifamily and apply the assumed numbers that I mentioned at the beginning, um, we are looking at an estimated annual water consumption of about 86 million gallons per year. Uh, put that in perspective, that ranges about 8 to 10 percent of our current annual production within the city, or annual consumption. Mm. So roughly 8 to 10 percent would be the commitment, if you will, uh, for 
developed, or excuse me, undeveloped, but approved, platted, single-family, duplex, multifamily type facilities. Okay. To put that into a bit of perspective um, was part of the question of Mr. Peterson and how it relates to some of the PBAC goals. And I realize this, the numbers on this are a bit difficult to read, trying to pack um, a graph of this length, and it gets longer here in a minute, uh, into the slide is unfortunately uh, requires some fairly small text. But this is a replica of a graph that has been seen a lot over the years, uh, is generated by the Blue Space and Aquifer Committee, PBAC. And this is a graph uh, that is duplicated uh, amongst all of the, wa the large water producing entities uh, within the basin, the members of PBAC. Uh, what it shows, in essence here, is the um, five-year moving average for annual pumping is the blue line that runs here, and this is for City of Moscow. So starting back in 1992, which was the beginning of the groundwater management plan, uh, we started tracking the five-year average um, each year <coughs> through that time frame. And you can see in Moscow that we started climbing rapidly in that first period of years, and kind of leveled off here in the, the late 90s. Uh, and then starting about 2003, we've really seen a decline uh, overall in that five-year average. Many reasons for that, uh, but presumably some of that is our conservation program, getting the message out to the uh, customers of, of you know, what we're trying to do and why it's important to conserve water and help uh, sustain those aquifers that we all rely upon. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting history. Uh, we have seen a little bit of growth uh, kicking back up here this last year. 2012 had a, had a pretty good number attached to it, so that five-year average starts to creep up a little bit. But that's not that uncommon. Occasionally we'll see a year with a blip here and there uh, along the way. Now the red line represents the one-year annual increase that was projected uh, for the city of Moscow in the groundwater management plan back in 1992, uh, starting with the numbers uh, in that 92 time frame and adding 1% cumulative on out. And as you can see, obviously we were well above that 1% uh, voluntary um, growth number, if you will, uh, for a good part of the, the origins of the plan, and then we passed back underneath it in about 2005, and we've been there ever since. That's a good place to be, but obviously um, part of the question that Mr. Peterson raised is what's going to happen to us long term? Have we, do we have commitments out there that we can't meet and still stay in compliance with the voluntary levels that were established in the groundwater management plan? So in using that uh, number I gave you earlier, that 86 million gallons per year, I worked on a projection of how that might fit in. And I, I word it that way in that we don't know exactly when those lots will be developed. So I put it into a five-year program estimating that if it's 20% of that every year for the next five years, mm. what would that do? And what you see then on the graph here is is the effect of that. So starting, let me back up one real quick. So it'd still be uh, under. You see 2012 was where we end, so then the next very, very next one starts in 2013, so we'd be right in here. So you can see that increase in usage based on the growth of homes that are currently, on, or would, would be uh, on those currently undeveloped parcels of land. So within that, um, you know, you're seeing a parallel to the 1% growth, which seems to be fairly consistent with City of Moscow's growth history, uh, how we grow as a populace, how we grow in development. Um, is it consistent with water use long term? Well, that, that is varied, um, and our charts aren't always as accurate that far back uh, to get a long term projection of what our growth has been from a water use perspective. Obviously, it, it varies, as you can see on this graph itself. But just in general, to uh, attempt to answer the question uh, with the uh, currently undeveloped but approved parcels being added in over the next five-year period, you can see the growth uh, in water consumption projected up through this period, and then the 1% uh, growth in the PBAC target range uh, continuing on. So again, fairly well underneath it. Uh, obviously, we'll need to continue to um, promote the conservation message, um, work on you know, other aspects of conservation uh, that can be implemented uh, within the city. So that remains to be seen how all that will work out, but that's in our future. And okay so far.
Thanks, Les. We appreciate your response. You remember at PBAC, or excuse me. Here we go. Okay. So just to summarize what we learned there, the groundwater management plan has two elements to it. The attempt to limit the annual aquifer pumping increases to 1% of the pumping volume based on the five-year moving average. That was that red sloping line that we saw in the graph that Les was presenting. And I really appreciate that he took a graphical approach to presenting this information. The second element of the groundwater management plan is at no time shall the accumulated pumping exceed 125% of the 81 to 85 average. So that 125% is the 875 million gallons per year, MGY. And I pulled this from the uh, PBAC website. Uh, the action plans for all the entities are posted there. So at the bottom of the slide, to summarize what we learned, uh, in 2013, the city pumped 851 million gallons a year. Uh, Less's estimate for unbuilt residential land was 86 million gallons per year, which would be a total of 937 million gallons per year, which exceeds our commitment to 875. So. I went back and I was looking and I went into the PBAC reports and I wrote a, letter, a note here to Steve Roshan saying one of the things that troubled me about the graph that they present, the PBAC standard graph, which they've done for a number of years, is it only shows the diagonal red line, the 1% increase, and it doesn't show the, the absolute cap at 125%. So I asked him whether, um, and he reproduced all these emails because this is the PowerPoint that he took to the PBAC meeting. Um, so there's a conflict between the red line and the statement at no time shall there be a accumulated pumping. Um, I'd like to continue this conversation with planning and zoning. That's what we're doing tonight. And I wanted to see whether I was interpreting his graphs correctly and to talk with PBAC about it. Anyway, so he put it on the agenda for February 20, and I attended that meeting to discuss rendering the line. And what he had at that meeting in this PowerPoint was this chart, which is a screenshot you will recognize from the uh, thing we just saw of Les presenting the answer to my question. And then Steve imposed the second constraint on it. My request was, would PBAC consider showing both the 1% increase until it hit the 125% ceiling? So here we are, 2014, and maybe at 2018, if we grew at the rate that Les was estimating, um, we would cross it. But in any case, with a horizontal ceiling, Sooner or later, unless every new use that comes in gets resource from savings from another use, sooner or later we're likely to cross through that line. Okay, so again, summarizing 851 in 2013, Les's estimate of 86, total is 937, the cap is at 875. This is the question that I would like your input on. Does the commission wish to request direction from council regarding Moscow's potential to exceed the 125% limit in the groundwater management plan? The only direction that we have from council at present is the groundwater management plan itself. What we can see, and it's a few years out, and it's not a crisis, we're not going to run out of water, but there's a potential for us pushing up against that limit and no longer meeting our voluntary commitment to our partners in PBAC. And are you interested as a group in asking council to give us any new advice, direction, thoughts as to how to consider this possibility? So that's, that's the framing and now like to hear a discussion. 
could you, uh, the 125 percent is 125 percent of what? Of the number that was the 1992 number, it was 700 million gallons per year. So we're putting a cap at 125 percent of that for all time? Mm -hmm. That's what the current We would agreement. never use more water than that no matter how big Moscow got? That's what the agreement says. Which 25 years ago wasn't maybe such a problem to agree to. But now we're getting to the end of the 25 years and the look on your face is, huh. Well, it just seems like it doesn't allow for other dynamics that occur in the world. <laughs> uh, and, and I asked Steve Roshan a little bit about that. The science about the aquifer in 85, 92, as they were doing this work, they thought that if we increased our use slowly, the 1%, up to some amount around the 125, the aquifer would stabilize. And so it was picked around the frame, the science at the time, that this was the best science for managing the aquifer. What we've seen is the aquifer haven't, hasn't stabilized, so the science wasn't quite right. But the political agreement is this 125% cap. I have a question on the city. I remember having mandatory watering times after 6 o'clock at night, before 9 or whatever it was in the morning for multiple years. And did that stop at some point and it became advisory? And does that account for why we started to go up in I, or not? I don't, I, I don't know. I'm still following that regulation, but I found out from my neighbor that it's not in place anymore. So well, it is, is in place. It is in place. There's a watering season that's established. Right, from May to yeah. and September. Yeah, well, it's whenever it's declared. There's not a right. static date. Okay. It's something that the public works director declares when conditions warrant it. So okay. they monitor our soil conditions, how much rainfall we've had, okay. declare the watering season. In the watering season, there is that restriction that you know you can't water the gas after 10 a.m. or you know until after 6 p.m. Um, and so that is in place. You can get a Variance from it if you're establishing a lawn and you need to water it more frequently, you can get a variance um, from that. But that's that's still an order. That's still in place. Yes. So that didn't account for the blip of going up no. in 20. Would you mind brought up the slide in the feedback plan? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, just don't want to hijack. So, but no. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, right. So the city has instituted over the period since '92 several conservation strategies. That was one water more efficiently, right. basically. And the tiered water rates was implemented somewhere in that period as well, uh, so that there's a base rate and then for filling your swimming pool and other larger uses, there's a premium. Uh, and those, so when you see that one graph, it, it rose and then it dipped down. I think we saw that conservation getting the word out, that's, I agree with less. We got, we got smarter. And our rain, average rainfall. It's been going down. Rainfall has gone down a bit. Yeah. I mean, it was, dip, what, 15 and a half inches last year or something? I, I could tell yeah. you something. It was um, definitely, I just know I did a zero scaping landscape project in, <laughs> in 1994, and I didn't have to water for quite a few years, and now I have to water in the summer. Mm -hmm. From, with native, you know, using native, native plants. plants. Yeah. Do like I do, just mow. Oh, that's really intensive unless you want to look at straw. <laughs> so let it go, let it go, yeah. let it go, let it go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it just brought this up. This what? was out of the 2012, I think, um, water report on mm -hmm. PBAC's website. So, so that's you can see that's obviously the, the chart that was shown previously and does have the 1% the that makes up the red line. Um, there is, uh, on the next page, the 125 cap does show it's, it's represented differently and it's not projecting uh -huh. out the future. So just huh. to, right. this top graph is Pullman, and so the green line is their 125 cap, mm -hmm. and they've been right hovering under, under, it. Right hundred, hundred, un, under it. This is Moscow's, and so we went over it back in 94, again in 96, again in 98, and again in 2003. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I don't know that's ever been really resolved is we also have 
the Wanapon, which is the shallow aquifer here, that doesn't exist over in Pullman. You know, that, that formation pinches out and doesn't exist any longer. The Wanapon has lesser quality water, and that's why the city kind of made the transition to the deeper source. But we still take a mix from some shallower wells and some deeper wells. And the Wanapum has been shown, the shallower aquifer has been shown to recharge when we have reduced our withdrawals. The Grand Ron, I don't know that that's well understood. It's, it's, I think it's believed not to recharge. Hmm. It's so well, it does very, very slowly since yeah. the last ice age. <clears throat> so I think there has been some questions why it's shown a little bit differently on this graph. The green is what's being pulled from the Wanapum, and the blue is what's being pulled from the deeper Grand Ron. And mm -hmm. so you know, I think there's somewhat of a question of how does that cap fit into a shallow system that we may be the only one utilizing that does experience some level of recharge, where the deeper is obviously the one that has limited um, recharge. So that adds a little bit of a different complexity um, to the system as well. But the, but the fact that I mean we have gone we have gone over the cap in the past, and um, and certainly future growth is only going to push that that issue in the future. Joel, has PBAC uh, done any analysis as to the uh, continued relevance of the 125 percent number? They, this was adopted uh, quite some time ago, and you're suggesting that uh, understanding of the uh, aquifer may have improved during that time period. I'm just wondering if, if PBAC uh, has thoughts on it. Um, I, I certainly can't speak for them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I heard at the meeting that my question triggered some various bits of conversation um, that there was some recognition that the science has changed and the current evidence is that the aquifer has continued to decline. That is the deep aquifer. Bill's right. The shallow one, at one point, Moscow overpumped and then backed off. And so Moscow may have some idea of what the capacity of the shallow one is for pumping. But the deep one has never leveled off. Um, and then the other piece was, and this might be in, in part of what the, the council would take up, is there was some significant work, I think, amongst the parties to establish the agreement. And the agreement is working, more or less. The parties are attempting to adhere to it. The aquifer isn't cooperating with what the agreement thought, necessarily. Um, and so is there a need for the participants in the agreement to have a new conversation about this and our asking for advice might be one of the things that would trigger that because obviously we're looking ahead as a planning organization and saying there's a potential here that you cannot adhere to your agreement as we grow. So how would you like us to behave and, and council could answer in all sorts of ways. I don't want to pre Pre-frame what they might choose, but there's a range of things that they could could do. Yeah, I would point out a thought as as you were uh, running the video uh, that uh, um, this is essentially a conservative analysis that is based on presently approved um, developments, and the analysis as as uh, Les presented it is. Pretty assumes basically that there are no further <laughs> uh, approved developments. Correct. And the other bill, a question to you, the he enumerates residential uses. Does he use a water number that essentially is scaled to accommodate the also other parts of growth of the city, or are we missing? Is it? indeed conservative, that we're missing the new parks that might come on, the new commercial that might come on? I don't believe that it, it 
I can't, I'd have to you see what, what he I think, had done. Gallons. I think the number that was provided was the spreadsheet that I had tracked, and so I think what less used was this. This is where we track all of the existing undeveloped lots and then have the variables of household size and data yes, consumption and density. You can adjust these and it recalcs everything in, in the spreadsheet. But this is just, we kind of, we do this for ourselves to kind of manage, um, you know, kind of understanding of the number of lots that we have approved, both for single family residential, two family, and acreage for multifamily. Um, and I think the number that he generated, I actually was just, um, updating this number. Harvest Hills hasn't been finaled yet, but I had dropped that in. Um, but I think he had a number of 86 million, which is, which is that. So that is, that is just residential. Okay, um, so further conservatives to your point, Joel. Mm -hmm. John, it looked like you were edging forward to say something. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm sure, um, the, the committee knows that um, growth is not going to stop. I mean, there are going to be other subdivisions that are going to be okay. That's, that's just the way it is. Um, and so the information as far as the 125 percent and the baseline that was used back in 81 to 85 and then effectively put into use in 92, uh, that may have to be looked at again. I don't know. But uh, for essentially <coughs> if Moscow were to say we're no longer going to have any expansion or subdivisions, it would be just like closing down the patent office because somebody said we already have everything that we're ever going to have and mm -hmm. we're not going to do that now, we're not going to put ourselves in a position where planning and zoning is an obsolete function oh good <laughs> <laughs> that isn't going to happen either there's two things that aren't going to happen there's going to be some growth there are going to be some uh, some new uh, it's, uh, it's subdivisions and at the same time Planning and zoning is going to have a chance to look at them. And I don't know whether that helps or hurts your discussion, but, and I think you already knew that. I'm not telling you folks anything that I, I, you I assume already. that, but that's why I wanted to ask for direction. I wanted to see the commission. Well, I, wanted to I ask think for conservation is more the approach. I mean, you look at the city of Los Angeles, it hasn't stopped growing, and I don't think it ever will stop growing, but it uses a whole lot less. Um, water per, per, per household yeah. than Seattle, which feels that it has tons of water, which it does a I lot of I thought Seattle times. was down. Um, well, it may have come down, but uh, it may have come down recently. But, okay. but yeah. in seeing um, the comparison, so, I mean, you look at a city that will continue to grow in perpetuity, but it's found a way to, to curb its water use. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, not that they're going to at some point reach a, you know, a, a concrete wall where they can't get more water, but um, I, I think there are other strategies than just saying no growth. I mean, you know, it's, it's conservation of when we saw the, the turn in the, cur in the curve when, when the city started. Um, it, it, irrigation uses a lot of, I bet the highest percentage of household water use. Well, you have the distribution of that, and so. Typically, though, we assume irrigation accounts for about 30% of the detached single family user of their annual water uses is, is rough number. Varies a great deal depending upon the household and what, what how large a lot and so forth, but generally thirty percent is a number that's utilized to represent irrigation. So that can have a big impact just having people water at sensible times Absolutely. Of, of the day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's like what that. I do. And, Don't yeah. water at all and just mow until it quits growing. <laughs> well, that's a good strategy. Yeah. I see what you mean. A lot of people are doing me. My house is going to still irrigate since I'm fine. But yeah. Yeah. Not everything. <laughs> no, I think your, your response that what would be the best thing and what will eventually, I think, be the only thing uh, is that we have to all spend more time being more observant about the water we use and how we use it. Uh, Fixing you know, leaks, you know, and other things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the university, yeah. now they uh, water just about all of their green 
with uh, recycled water. And I don't know whether um, they were able to do it, but I am not so sure that the city could do it without a huge expense. Of, I mean, we'd end up having to put in <coughs> two water lines everywhere, you know, one for the recycled water to uh, wash cars with, to uh, water the lawn, to uh, clean areas up, and then the existing water lines for uh, potable water. Well, I don't think that's going to happen either. Sure. Something that I think might happen, though, is that for future developments that could be included in the infrastructure when you're putting in the water line and the sewer line, uh, a gray water type uh, system to irrigate uh, potential parks in the future um, for new subdivisions would have the option to use that kind of water for irrigation, which would, would stem the use of the potable water for that purpose mm -hmm. and could be helpful and could be something that would be a planning function that we try to mm -hmm. put that into future developments. Mm -hmm. Not that you would try to replace everything in the entire city all at once, but a new a new ones, uh, yeah. and, and, uh, subdivision or Sue Scott always kept saying, "I want my purple pipe." She will different color designation <laughs> for the purpose of every time you open the trench, she wanted to put purple pipe in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My two cents is that I don't know enough about all the issues involved to know even how to answer the question at this point. So I think it's I think it's a worth a worthwhile thing to ponder, but I'm not sure that. Tonight would be the time to make a decision on whether to ask the council the question. Maybe revisit it in a couple of in the next meeting or the meeting after. Okay. Any other sense? Did you say that the Palouse Basin um, Aquifer Committee uh, is a time for them to be nudged towards re-evaluating? It's not for me to say that no. it's time to nudge them, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, is, do you know if having been to their meetings or anything if they have I've, any? Plans? I've only attended the the one meeting uh -huh. on this particular topic, mm -hmm. um, and I only can report that there seemed to be a sense that there's some Chatter. feeling that the science didn't work out. Mm -hmm. with the way the aquifer behaved and perhaps but I think there would be a certain reticence that is it's a multi-party agreement mm -hmm. so it's going to be a complex thing to decide to change leave it the way it is essentially because of what you just said but all of the parties involved become more aware of conservation um, mm -hmm. would be, you know, one possible uh, way to approach the problem. Um, <coughs> are there other land use things, take, taking your comments earlier that we will continue to annex new land mm -hmm. and have that potential for growth probably not very quickly but yes but right I mean it, it's out there um, there might be other land use things that we could consider that could hmm. like, like Jim thought is to put some pipe in the ground uh, there might be other planning yeah. strategies that could be evaluated well use of gray water and use of rainwater and yeah, surface mm -hmm. water is another yeah. thing. The, the idea that... Uh, and recharging surfaces and permeable paving. Potable water is a finite resource, however you look at it. and it's, it, uh, So we're going to have to conserve that at some point. Mm -hmm. And so we might as well start now mm -hmm. with strategies to do that, uh, whether we're using surface water or reusing that water that we do pump or whatever. But it's like uh, oil or, you know, uh, we're going to run out of oil at some point. So we better have alternative energy strategies and we better have all the alternative water strategies because eventually that's going to happen. Okay. I, uh, you know, went through our water treatment plant and 
enormously impressed by the work that they do out there, uh, the, uh, the whole operation, and taking what comes into the plant and then looking at what comes out of the plant. Uh, it's said that it is safe, but the people out there that work there say, but I'm not going to drink it. <laughs> and uh, I've heard that said in more than one uh, place where the water is treated. And I think the time will eventually come uh, that uh, the treated water is going to become part and parcel of the drinking water in lots of places. They are using it in Los Angeles. I'm not sure whether they're drinking it. <laughs> well, in New Orleans, they, they sip the bowels of the nation coming down, because mm -hmm. I lived there for seven years, and the water's pretty bad coming yeah. out of the town. It doesn't happen because it comes out of the Mississippi River. Um, and you think of all the sewage treatment plants that feed into the Mississippi mm -hmm. River upstream from New Orleans, and it's kind of scary to think about drinking the water. So I take your sense that you're not ready to go f to proceed to try to ask council for direction. At least that was, I guess it was Gregory's comment. Well, I, you know, I wonder if we should, uh, if we're going to pursue this here from people like Jan, um, Jan, Jan, I can't think of his last name, he hints the water. The Kimberly. Bull, bull, yeah, 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 yeah. He's my neighbor, and I was facing his last name. Well, you know, and and maybe some talking heads on the subject a, a little bit. Um, if I, I would feel like I need to be better informed to know. I mean, I guess I'm in, in agreement with you. But, um. Okay. I mean, a, a couple things, just for a few pieces of information. The um, the question about long term water supply has been something the city has been discussing over the last uh, three years fairly extensively and looking at possible water, um, surface water reservoirs and impoundments that could either be utilized to offsite irrigation, could be utilized for potential aqua recharge, or could be utilized for you know, direct potable use. And uh, the city has been doing over the last, I guess, about three years now, fairly extensive studies of the watersheds both on Moscow Mountain on the north and south sides, as well as the Snake River, you know, really replicating a lot of the work that was done back by the USGS in the 60s, looking up to Dorshack and a pipeline to the region um, up from the Snake or surface water impoundments uh, on Moscow Mountain or, or local watersheds. And so that that study has gone through two phases so far, I think, two, two levels of preliminary analysis. The first was kind of a high level <coughs> Look, is, are there any watersheds? The second level we identified some that were feasible and also examined and did comparative cost analysis of the pipeline options from Dorshack and down the river. And those were reported, I think, well, I think at the day of the recording, I think when you were asking the question, it was, it was on that on that day, that some of the preliminary findings and results, those are all <coughs> very large public works projects um, that, that are going yes. to require federal significant federal dollars in order to accomplish in the tens of millions of dollars. And but you know those are being reexamined, just kind of looking ahead to the future to uh, identify there there is a there is a quite a bit of water that does fall here in precipitation. It just doesn't quite make it into the ground where it's being pumped from currently. And so it's a matter of how to try to collect, contain, store, treat, and dis and distribute that water. And then there have been several studies done on the you know, expansion of the water reuse out to areas to try to reduce the amount of potable that's used for irrigation purposes. And it is a very, even if we reach into new subdivisions on the edge, the source is all the way on the other side of town. <laughs> yeah. And it is it is a very, looking at sizable locations where that can be utilized. And, and you would first go to like parks, play fields, big facilities that use a lot of irrigation water, and they would be your high targets. We pretty much already saturated the U of I campus for the most part, yeah. um, and so that's taking a large part of it. And at this point in time, the U of I filed a water right on some of that effluent, so we don't really know <laughs> the legal ramifications <laughs> of being, us being able to use more of it. Um, but there, it is a significant cost to to even just reach that new subdivision that's happening on the far east side of town to, to take advantage of that system. And 
there have been several a couple studies done and some cost tests been prepared, and, and that's information I could certainly get from the Public Works Department to show <coughs> of what it would take to get it to Joseph or Mountain View Park or some, some of these or some park facilities that, that could utilize that to try to offset. And then when you look at the amount of water consumption is really offsetting for the cost, it becomes a difficult business case to make is, is it, to some degree. So I know that you know, th those are two areas that that you know, have been looked at and continue to be explored um, to try to address that long-term issue. And it is a, I mean, it is a, a big issue in the long run. Nils, is there a, is there some, because you put this on the agenda, it, what were you looking for from us? I mean, what would you like, what ideally had you hoped that we would do, right? I'm, I'm a, trying to figure that out. Right? My <laughs> hope was that you would be interested in asking council for further direction as to how to think about this issue. Okay. Uh, rather that we could make up right. water from Dwarjak solves right, right, problems. Right, right, right. right. No, I, but I don't Council like I might not follow it, through on that right, right. solution. <laughs> right, we could right. make up conservation will solve the problem right. forever on. Right. Uh, which may or may not mm -hmm. conservation itself will cost money. <coughs> Uh, Pullman does a toilet rebate program. Council could decide that yes, we're going to be aggress more aggressive about conservation and instruct us. We've got her covered. Carry on, right. or any of a number of things. So what I was wondering was whether you were interested in asking them the question, not answering the question, but just asking what would you like us to think. We've heard John's perspective. You will continue to annex and zone and et cetera land. I expected that part. Yeah. <laughs> but the other part is, and don't worry about the PBAC cap because it'll take care of itself. How? Would be the, the thing that would be the most interesting part to me. Well, from what I understand, um, and Walter knows, Steve knows more about this than I. But uh, your comment about the science uh, that was used uh, and the fact that it uh, uh, may no longer apply, that particular bit of science. You've learned more, I think. Yeah. And uh, I think that was probably the best comment or the best uh, might be to uh, find out just exactly what the science is and what it would take, even though it would be more of a uh, more of a hassle because of the people that are involved or the groups that are involved to get them all to sign off on a new set of numbers. Mm -hmm. But that may be a, a place to start. I don't know. So I, I guess I would like, I would still like to know more. I, me too. Uh, yeah. I, I, Bill referred to the, the, the various studies I, uh, that have been going on. I'd like, I'd like to know some of those, okay. some of what was done there. Uh, so how about this? I will work with Bill to identify some more background material for you. Maybe some of that will be on our reading list, for example. Yeah. Um, and then we'll work to find a time looking forward in the agendas when yeah. we can bring back some of it in some form or another. It might meeting. be worthwhile uh, uh, inviting John in to. John Bolton. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm happy Sounds with good. that. Thank you. From what, from what Bill said, there's a great deal of interest and in, in research going on uh, on this topic right. it's not like it's being ignored and we need to spur someone to uh, for us to do some action there's there's a lot going on and the problems recognized and it's and it's being a, approached in a number of different from a number of different angles and like uh, Nell said if we could uh, get more information it would be more okay. helpful to okay. deciding whether we want it I, and my suspicion is that the council is probably not in a position either uh, to directly advise us. Uh, so they, I suspect they're collecting information too. <laughs> well, we we would do 
exactly what you just suggested. We'd go back to Bill and um, ask him, could you enumerate what's going on, you know, um, even though we all know little parts of what's going on, you know, give us bullet points on who's doing what and uh, where they're going, where they're coming from, and what they think the, uh, so actually, okay, at this so, point. That's the path that I yeah. will pursue then. One thing that I would like to hear, and I'm not, not sure, Bill, whether the stuff that you've been involved with has, uh, has done this, but I, I would like to uh, know more about the, uh, the budget of the water system uh, mm -hmm. relative to uh, additional costs that might be involved in doing some of the things we might do, like uh, piping water to uh, the uh, Mountain View playfields and so on. And what, what would be the implication uh, to uh, uh, water rates? Uh, if one were adding some of the reuse, uh, surface water acquisition, um, pumping from Dorshack, um, types of, and the, the, the number of assumptions <laughs> that would have to go into that calculation, I, I realize would be a, pro sure. be a problem. But uh, uh, I don't, I don't know much about the uh, the, the finances of, of water. The uh, I, I've I've looked a bit at some of the some of the old studies. I, you said uh, USGS, I thought it was the Corps of, en Corps of Engineers study from '72 or something like that. And I've, yeah, four, which five. and uh, uh, the the cost estimates that they had in there were just truly mind blowing. Well, we can uh, we can give me nothing but. No surface water reservoir and no pipeline from the Snake or pipeline from Dorshack is going to be carried by a ratepayer. It just absolutely can't. And the, the feds are kind of reluctant to do it too. <laughs> well, the, and the feds are reluctant to do it because there are regions of the nation that are in much more dire straits in the area yeah. west. And it blows their budget. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, you, you know, you're talking about water where federal resources are going. It's not, it's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's Las it's, Vegas. Yeah, I mean, there are areas in the southwest and, and that, that are that are in, in those dire straits. We have a voluntary number that we're bumping up against. Mm -hmm. our, our wells are not going dry. We don't even fully understand the resource quite yet. I mean, there's a lot of um, a lot of uncertainty in the system still, and that's the problem with underground <laughs> systems and fractured rock environments with yeah. interbeds and faults and all things. It is difficult to characterize, and I don't know that we still adequately yeah. understand the system if it extends all the way out into eastern Washington or where are the mountains. Um, where what we probably do know is we're on the shallow edge of the bathtub, and that's mm -hmm. not the best place to be uh, when everybody else is pulling from the same yeah. resource. Uh, but there are a lot of theories about how it looks. So. Um, so I, you know, I think I think it was realistic about the, getting a federal earmark for you know, half a yeah. million dollars to build a you know a facility is, is not yeah. going to happen going to happen yeah. in the near future. Yeah. Uh, but I think it would be helpful, and and they do have information, is if we could pull together um, there's sections of the sewer master plan and the water master plan that kind of look at water use and conservation activities and effluent re reuse. We can get copies of the, the surface water reservoir studies and the summaries of those and the various options and the cost the implications of those and share that um, and go back and look at the you know the PBAC and the water use. I mean, PBAC is a, a wealth of information in the annual water use reports and the original 92 plan. That's all good good information, um, but it's the bottom line is it comes down to it, it's it, at, at some point in the future it's a big problem with the large dollar point unless all of a sudden we hit some magic equilibrium that was anticipated to have occurred previously if we stabilized the annual reduction that the aquifer would stabilize. You know, unless somehow that begins to happen. Now, water line declines have slowed in the last two, three years. So there has been a trend of you know, significant drops to one and a half two feet per year and it's dropped to a foot or less than a foot or something. Or there's there's some, some, some kink. To there's the been year. some kink to the line. And it's just appeared in the last three years, I think, or kind of roughly in the recent history. And less is much more. It's, this really <laughs> is his area. Yeah, but we can certainly pull together some of that information. Um,
and share that and continue the conversation yeah. as the commission would like to. Okay. No, the conclusion I reached when I was looking at those old core studies was that if we build it and if we put the cost into our water rate base, the rates would go up so much that we would conserve so much water because we couldn't afford it <laughs> uh, that we wouldn't need the pi pipeline. <laughs> so the solution is just to raise the price then. Which is what the city went that, that. to the tiered rate. Yeah, Los know, Angeles has higher rates than Seattle. <laughs> I mean, we we tiered the rates that you pay more than more that you use in order to try to incentivize conservation. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's also it's a double edged sword because you're, you need a certain amount of revenue to run the operation, and so you need to balance that you know, base rates and demand. And as you tier incentive based rates, it's something that has to be um, explored. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Great. Thank you for a good discussion. Number nine is a discussion regarding tandem parking allowance consideration. <laughs> and the intent this evening just kind of introduce the topic and not really look for any final decision or direction, but just to kind of think about it. Um, the zone code, as it relates to parking, specifies you know the number of parking spaces that are required for a variety of uses and some multifamily may be based on bedrooms single families two per unit um, commercial may be based on square footage or the number of employees or what have you um, it has dimensional standards for parking stalls but it really is silent on a tandem configuration and a tandem configuration it, what we're what we're encountering requests for um, is you know one car parked behind the other and oftentimes it's one in a garage and one behind you can have tandem garages Tampa Commons has tandem garages where they have it's a two-car garage but it's in a tandem configuration it's a long skinny uh, garage and we have been approached recently um, from by some potential developers looking at whether we would um, allow or recognize tandem parking in multifamily projects traditionally we have recognized tandem configurations in single family and two family development usually in a household like that where the parking is segregated and separated they can coordinate among themselves without having to back the car up because my car's in the garage when you get into a multi-family setting where we have a parking standard let's say if, uh, if it's a one bedroom unit it's 1.25 stalls per bedroom or per unit if it's a two family units 1.75 stalls for that dwelling unit if you're three or more bedrooms it's 0.75 stalls per bedroom and so you know when you start to get into multifamily developments the parking begins to act as a pooled resource it's a common parking lot everybody has common access and right of use and if one unit is occupied by one person with one car and the next unit next door is three people with three cars that resource can flex based upon the demand and the need um, from the various households and dwellings that are in that complex and we have been hesitant to look at tandem parking where one vehicle can either preclude or block the access to the other parking stall um, and we really have had very little um, interest in the past to pursue it so anyhow, yeah, we we had a, a, a question on some projects that we're really looking at infill projects um, in existing developed areas that may be looking at redevelopment in, a, in multifamily units and asking and wanting to provide a facility of a garage that you don't normally have with a multifamily project and we're looking to a, a higher end multifamily maybe not necessarily targeted at students but at um, working professionals faculty staff or, and others and there are some there are some benefits in having some parking underneath the building we end up ultimately <coughs> reducing some of the exterior hardscape and impervious surface we we get some increased density on the site because parking is tend is tends to be what limits the number of units you can get on a site and if we get some parking underneath the building then that helps be able to maximize some of the building footprint um, and so there are some there are some benefits the kind of general concept that was was um, shown on a concept site plan was you know there'd be a garage and a parking space behind it and it was a I think it was a six or eight unit building with you know, two bedroom units and those two spalls would be assigned to individual units and so they have to work on coordinating their own parking and this is something that's been um, they've been building the same projects up in the uh, Coeur d'Alene and, and Liberty Lake area <coughs> and which is kind of interesting. Court Lane has a specific pro prohibition against tandem parking, but they uh, apparently were allowing it. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
Anyhow, th there are some potential benefits of, of increased utilization of the property, reduced vehicle surface parking utilization. Um, but in that example where you have two bedroom apartments and they have two stalls, they're really exceeding, you know, per unit, they're exceeding our parking standard 1.75 stalls per unit. Um, but we don't have that flexible resource. Those two stalls are very individually assigned to each of those units because you can't park behind somebody else's garage door and prohibit their access into it. And then the concern we had was the guests and visitors. There's really, there was no place on the site for those individuals to park without parking behind somebody else's garage door and blocking them. And so uh, we did some preliminary research looking at a few communities um, about how they addressed tandem or twin um, tandem or stacked parking, which are the two terms that are generally utilized. Um, so there's there's kind of a table in the back here that, um, and you can see that there's there's a pretty consistent trend under multifamily that it's not recognized very often. Um, Lewiston is their zoning code is much like ours, so Pullman doesn't allow it for multifamily post falls. Um, doesn't seem to allow it. Although there's some projects that are we're being shown that seem to be. Um, counter to that a little bit. Um, Lewiston has no mention zoning code. They, they permitted to paint on the layout of the development um, and they want to have them assigned for designated units if they're going to recognize them. Um, Missoula is permitted for single family duplexes and multifamily developments with garages. So, you know, and the space in front of the garage must be some designated for that unit so that can function that way. Um, Boise has some discretion to land, allow tandem stacked in certain situations um, based upon size constraints and physical limitations of the site. Uh, Coeur d'Alene, it's, it's explicitly not permitted, but the, we actually talked with one of the folks and they're permitting projects with it, so I don't, um, I'm not sure, but they've got a section of code that's really clear. Um, <laughs> Spokane doesn't allow it, except in some commercial where there's a valet. Um, Bozeman doesn't do it for, um, for uh, multifamily, except for individual townhouses and condominium units, and duplexes where they get that physically separated driveways. Again, it's kind of that they're managing their own parking space, and it's not the full resource. Um, and Seattle does. Um, they only recognize, I think, half of the parking spaces that are in tandem configuration. So that does allow for some other parking to be provided on site uh, to ac uh, accommodate some flexible use for those that may exceed the demand of the two spaces here, but there's three people living in the two bedroom apartment and they have another vehicle. So having some additional parking above and beyond helps meet that flexible need. It also helps meet the need of the guests and visitors who may be coming um, to the site to not walk somebody else's garage. And, it, and it's, it really kind of depends on the site. Some, some locations, if you have a great deal of available on-street parking that can be utilized, that helps meet that need. But some of these projects we're looking at you know, have no on-street parking in any vicinity, and so any overflow is going to show up in somebody, the apartment complex is the next door parking lot, because there's really no other place for it to go. Um, we have kind of looked at it, and I had uh, some of my staff kind of do some research and make some you know, preliminary recommendations of possibly uh, allowing it in multifamily, but only recognizing 25% of the spaces that would be blocked by another stall. Um, so that we're giving some recognition of benefit of those spaces. But you know the risks are possibly they become storage units full of stuff and are no longer effectively there for parking. Two, they may not be as efficiently utilized because vehicles, somebody can pull in and park in front of it because they don't have the garage door open or what have you, and they block the access for the next person who comes to try to get in there. Um, and the guest side, I mean, those are kind of our three. You know, what's the risk of doing this as far as the dysfunction and the function of the overall project or site? And those are kind of the three things we've, we've identified as being potential risks. And one way to mitigate against that risk would be to only recognize a certain percentage and maybe a small percentage of those spaces. Um, in a project we're looking at, even recognizing 20 to 25 percent, you know, made it work, which was, and, and so, you know, they were, they, you know, I guess the individual was happy if we could at least recognize a, a percentage of the sites. Um, and then we would want to make sure that um, the, um, you know, the, the site, the spaces would have to be assigned to the individual units so that they can coordinate themselves on how they would utilize them. And probably only do it, I think, only because there's a garage space there. Uh, we're really not trying to look into parking lot and 
park tandem in a parking lot. I mean, that, that I don't think makes a lot of sense. But in order to try to facilitate the building footprint, the giving parking underneath the building, maximizing some of the of the building area on the site, and minimizing a little bit, reducing a little bit of the parking footprint on the site, um, that that might be something that we would suggest considering. So I just wanted to kind of give you know run through the memo and some of the research results that we had on that and see what the commission's thoughts on the topic were. Why just um, why just a garage? Why require one being a garage if it's say a single family residence or a multifamily with a long driveway? For single family, we would we would continue to recognize it, a garage or not. Uh, multifamily, you get into a parking lot. So what, if you're anything fewer than something requiring fewer than um, four stalls, then we, we don't have much in the way of dimensional standards. Single family, two family can back out on the street. Multifamily cannot. So multifamily and commercial uses cannot make a backing movement out onto the street. So when you move into multifamily, you're moving into a parking lot configuration. Okay. A single and two family, your driveways or townhouse. You know, you need driveways on those individual users. But as you move into multifamily, um, generally there are no backing movements allowed on the public street. There's a lot of old ones in town that do. But if you're establishing a new use today, you wouldn't be allowed to. And so when you get over that four parking spaces in an area, then you kick into the parking lot design development standards and the travel out widths and landscaping standards and no prohibited prohibitions on backing into the public right away. So there is a bit of a distinction between the single and two family and townhouses and how multifamily functions. Okay, so this is addressing the bigger Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm not proposing to make any changes of what we've done historically on single family and two family. I think that all works fine. If somebody wants to have a one car garage and, the dry, and a driveway just behind it, we, 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 we're not proposing to make any change there. We just haven't got making that step into multifamily. And we see some benefits in doing it, and we also see some risks in the function of the site in doing it, and so we just want to mitigate that and maybe we can meet it in the middle and still allow some benefit while mitigating the risk and to make sure that they just function well. And our, goal, our overall goal is to make sure that sites function well and we don't have things spilling out onto the street or on Sidewalks. these properties <laughs> yeah. to try to, because they can't meet the demand. And so, um, but we also want to provide the opportunity for people that, that may not wish or be able to buy a home to have the same benefits of having a garage if they want to. And, and, and so, um, you know, we, we want to provide that opportunity if we can. We just yeah. want to make sure that it's going to work. Um, and there's yeah. a lot of, in this way, a lot of communities maybe don't allow it or only allow it in pretty limited situations when you get to multifamily. I'm, I'm just trying to visualize the variable right? you know, like just allowing 25%. I mean, I understand the reasoning, but I'm trying to figure out how it would actually work and how you manage the building. I mean, you, you tell this tenant they can park ten, tandem, but the next tenant can't. Is that what? Or no, am I just, it's just not it's understanding. Just, yeah, we would only recognize that. So they're going to build. They would stack it. It would only be where there's a sign and the place and the, and the garage space. And so they would have to designate it, it would on be the site. With Correct. Paint. We would just yeah. only recognize up the garage spaces. We'd only recognize a certain percentage, which means they'd have to put surface parking in a non-tenant configuration elsewhere on the site right. to meet that overflow of the apartment that has four people and four. So cars. they could have it on every one, but you would only recognize of the garage spaces. Gotcha. We would only recognize 25 percent of the spaces towards their minimum off. Now there's. There's another way, another calculation of saying, well, we're going to require, you have to provide 50% above the minimum required, I think, you know, targeting it to the garage spaces and just discounting what we'd recognize is probably the way to do it. I see. So, I mean, I, 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 a, we have a request from the development community to think about it. And there are some benefits which you've identified and some risks so it seems like I'm looking to get the sense of the group but to think through to, to bring us some sort of a proposal or something to think through in, in specificity <coughs> I think is, is worthwhile yes I, I've seen that <laughs> around the group so okay. sort of an incremental step towards allowing it and seeing how it works yeah, well, yeah, do the do yeah. research make us a proposal uh, we can think about it and what the constraints are and implications for visitors and those sorts of things. There was a general bullet points on, uh, well, the second page of the memo. And the first of which was if it's, if it's adjacent to an arterial or, or collector street, then only 25% of the garages would be counted. Second is if it was not on an arterial or collector. 
the implication is that means there's probably going to be on street parking. That 50% of the spaces would be counted. Um, you know, I, street designations can change over time. I tend to, you know, want to think think that through whether we want to make a distinction based upon the street classification. It's not that they change a bunch, but they can. And I don't want to see a street classification render a project non-conforming <laughs> because now all of a sudden the street classification has changed at some point in time. So yeah, that was a, a thought because of just the fact of trying to recognize on-street parking, but then parking management can change over time. Parking can be stripped, can be added. And I don't like, and that's outside of the owner's control because it's a public works decision that we're going to strip parking because we think we need snow removal or increased capacity or what, there's a conflict. They want to, we're going to put bike lanes. We're stripping parking. Oh no, now I just built this project and we decided, the city decided to put a bike lane and strip stripping parking mm -hmm. and am I now no longer compliant or not? So, you know, <laughs> it may be the, you know, there's really no risk of moving into it on the, on the low end incrementally, see how it works. If we think it's working really well, we can, we could increase the percentage that are recognized at some point in the future. So my conservative nature is to start maybe low as far as what we recognize and kind of see how it functions. If we have to see if people take advantage of it, if it's something people want to do, and then we could evaluate how it works and, and take a look at it again some years down the road. But um, if that's generally agreeable, we can work up a kind of an outline of what it might look like. Thank you. Do you have a okay. Sounds good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other things for the good of the order? Otherwise, we are adjourned. Thank you. Keep the good weather.